Welcome to the fifth lecture in this series, The Bible in Egypt, in search of a correct Egyptian chronology. Now previously we looked at the strengths and weaknesses of the various views of who to identify in Egyptian history with the Pharaoh the Bible calls Shishak, as well as the best fit in biblical history for the events described in the El Amar letters, which were written in the late 18th dynasty. Now the synchronisms we looked at in previous lectures pointed to the 18th dynasty ending just before 800 BC. Now if the 25th dynasty starts only 100 years later, where do we fit in Ramses the Great's 19th dynasty and the 20th dynasty of Ramses III, who defeated the Sea Peoples, as well as the Libyan dynasties? In the next two lectures, we're going to look at the, this squeeze of dynasties problem and look at the best way to resolve one of the most puzzling mysteries of ancient history. Now these next two lectures will be somewhat akin to a court case. In this lecture we will hear first from the prosecution against Velikovsky's view of a gap between dynasties 18 and 19, and hear from the defence of Velikovsky's position who will have a chance to cross-examine the evidence presented by the prosecution. In the next lecture we will hear from the defence the evidence supporting a gap between these two best documented but most controversial dynasties before I give my concluding comments based on who I believe has best argued their case. So let's briefly look at what we'll be covering in Lecture 5 of the series which examines the evidence put forth by those who do not believe that there is a gap between dynasties 18 and 19. So we're going to start off with looking at a particular synch a key synchronism between Superlulamus of the Elamana letters with the Hittite king Superlulamus I. Then we're going to look at pottery evidence that argues against the gap between the two dynasties. Then look at genealogical evidence that indicates that one followed straight after the other. And then finally we're going to look at some evidence put forth by David Roll with regards to the Bubastite portal that argues for dynasties 19 and 20 ruling before the Libyan dynasties. Now the best evidence for who the biblical Shishak who plundered the temple in Jerusalem in the time of Solomon's son, son Rehoboam, I felt leaned towards Velikovsky's view of identifying the biblical Shishak with Tuthmose III of the mid-18th dynasty. Now Velikovsky was close, but not close enough when it came to who I felt had the best evidence to lock in the Elamana period of the late 18th dynasty. The evidence of the Elamana letters to me seemed to best fit the time of Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram. Now these two synchronisms complement each other in terms of how far these events are apart in both Egypt and Israel based on them. The time between Tutmos III and Akhenaten is about the same time between Shishak's plunder of the temple to Jehoram. Now they seem to lock in the time of the 18th dynasty in Egypt from the time of King Saul to the middle of the divided kingdom in Israel. Well, at least that's what the synchronistic evidence points to. Now virtually all revisionist chronologists agree with the conventional chronology that Egypt's chronology from the 25th dynasty to its last dynasty prior to the conquest of Alexander is mostly settled and fixed. The 25th dynasty can be cross-checked with Assyrian data and is dated to around 700 BC. Teharka, one of the Ethiopian 25th dynasty pharaohs, was a contemporary of Hezekiah, according to the Bible. Now if the 25th dynasty starts only 100 years later than the end of the 18th dynasty, where do we fit in Ramses the Great's 19th dynasty, the 20th dynasty of Ramses III and the Libyan dynasties? can they all be squeezed into this brief period of a hundred years? Do some of them run parallel with the later dynasties after the start of Dynasty 25? Or as scholars such as Peter James, David Roll and John Bimson have concluded, they all came before Dynasty 25 and as a consequence we have to reject the synchronisms of Shishak with Tutmos III and the Elamana period with the time of Jehoram, despite how solid the evidence for those synchronisms look all on their own. 
Now, Peter James, John Bimson and David Roll claim that there is solid evidence that connects the New Kingdom dynasties as ruling successively soon after each other and before the Libyan dynasties. Now, David Roll has some parallel rule of Dynasty 20 with the Libyan dynasties, but places the reign of Ramses III before the Libyan dynasties. Now, in the third volume of the series, Ramses II and His Time, Velikovsky shocked many of his followers by placing Ramses the Great in the 7th century BC and arguing that the 8th, 18th and 19th dynasties were separated by about 150 years, with the Libyan and Ethiopian dynasties, dynasties 22 to 25, ruling in between them. Now, again, Velikovsky predominantly used synchronistic evidence in placing Ramses the Great in the 7th century BC, showing a string of running coincidences in the war annals of Ramses the Great, and those of the pharaoh known as Nico in the Bible who contested for control of Syria and Palestine with Nebuchadnezzar. Now amongst those were similarities between the Battle of Kadesh, fought by Ramses the Great against the Hittites, and the Battle of Carchemish between Nico and Nebuchadnezzar who Barry Kernock later argued was allied with the Hittites. Now, Velikovsky's separation of the Manetho order of these dynasties became a bone of contention and led to modifications and eventual abandonment of Velikovsky's placement of dynasties by many of his supporters. Initially, some of those revised scholars supported the 18th dynasty placement in time by Velikovsky with a slight extension finding better evidence for Abdi Heba being Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram rather than Jehoshaphat. Now they believe that there are items of genealogical evidence supporting the conventional view that the 19th dynasty immediately followed the 18th dynasty and similar evidence supporting the conventional view that the 20th dynasty immediately followed the 19th dynasty. Now this led to the formation of the Glasgow chronology which is rather similar to Donovan Corwell's chronology, where the 18th dynasty was placed where Velikovsky placed it, followed immediately by the 19th and 20th dynasties, which were somewhat parallel with the Libyan and Ethiopian dynasties. Now, when further evidence came along, which they interpreted as proof the Libyan and Ethiopian dynasties were not contemporary with either the 19th and 20th dynasties, they further rejected Velikovsky's placement of the 18th dynasty. Now, those revisionist chronologists who rejected Velikovsky's placement of Dynasty 18 put higher emphasis on the evidence connecting the dynasties and found themselves with less synchronistic evidence to support their differing chronologies. Now, we've already seen the problems with their candidates for the biblical Shishak and their two early placements for the Elamana period. In the case of the revisionists I have noted previously, they have placed greater weight on the connecting evidence, even though there seems to be less synchronistic evidence supporting their chronology. <coughs> now, is there really a contradiction in the evidence? Now, if not, which evidence should we trust? The synchronistic evidence that Velikovsky put forth or the connecting evidence as put forth by John Bimson, David Roll, and Peter James. Now, Velikovsky placed greater weight on the synchronistic evidence, and those who still stick with his placement of dynasties have to contend with how to explain the connecting evidence. Are they really the smoking gun, as argued by Peter James, John Bimson, David Roll, and others, or can they be explained without clutching at straws to support the separation of dynasties, argued by Velikovsky? Now, if evidence arguing for a separation of dynasties 18 and 19 and a reordering of the dynasties can really be taken seriously, there needs to be reasonable counter-arguments to each of these arg arguments. Now, let's now take a look at those arguments for preserving the conventional order of dynasties and see if they are the smoking gun that some scholars claim them to be or whether the counter-arguments are solid enough. Now, the first argument supporting the conventional order of dynasties comes from the Elamana letters, number 41. There is one Elamana letter and no others to the pharaoh from a super Lulamus. 
Now the tablet is damaged and where this king rules is not clear on the tablet. Now according to conventional Egyptology, this superlulimus from the singular letter is assumed to be one and the same as Hittite Emperor Superlulimus I. Now if so, then this Hittite Emperor Superlulimus I would have been a contemporary of Akhenaten and Tutankhamun. We know his son Mercilus was the enemy of Seti I, and after them the two sons of Mercilus, Hattuselus and Mawatulus, were contemporaries of Ramses II. Ramses II, after fighting the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh, made a peace treaty with Hattuselus III. So if Hattuselus III's grandfather was the superlulimus of that Elamana letter, then this would mean that Seti I of the 19th dynasty lived a generation after Akhenaten and Tutankhamun of the 18th dynasty. Now in his 2003 SIS review article, Finding the Limits of Chronological Revision, John Bimson writes, in his Glasgow conference paper on the Hittites, Peter James also concluded that the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties had followed each other without break. He subsequently expanded on his objections to Velikovsky's scheme in his review of Ramses II and his time. There he pointed out that the Hittite Emperor Superlulimus was a contemporary of Akhenaten and Tutankhamun. His son Merciless was the enemy of Seti I, and the two sons of Merciless, Hattuselus and Mawatulus, were contemporaries of Ramses II. He also pointed out that Velikovsky's attempt to break these links by dividing Superlulimus into two people who lived at two different times did not solve the problem, because a whole string of other characters were also involved. Thus, Velikovsky will not only have to devise two Superlulimuses to agree with his later dates for the 19th dynasty, he will have to create two Azuras, king of, kings of Amaru, two Tashradas, kings of Matani, and two Hittite generals called Lapaki. Such a proliferation of exact duplicates renders the scheme incredible. So is the Superlulimus of the Amarna letters and the Hittite Emperor Superlulimus one and the same person? What about the Azuras, the Tasratas and the Hittite generals called Lapaki? Are the contemporary counterparts of Superlulimus I one and the same as those of the Elamana period? Now, for his comments showing that there are clear discrepancies between all these individuals alleged to be one and the same by the same name, I'd like to now quote from Barry Kernock's book, From Havilah to Thou Comest to Shur. Now, Barry writes here, In the synchronization between Superlilimus I and the Amarna letters, one piece of evidence is crucial. In the deeds of Superlilimus, Mercilus records that when his father was besieging Carchemish, the strategic city on the river Euphrates in northern Syria. The emperor received an envoy from the Queen of Egypt. Now her name is given as Daha Manzu. The Egyptian Queen Daha Manzu did not wish to marry one of her subjects, but asked for a Hittite prince to become her husband. Superlilibus was very surprised by the request. We should also be surprised if this request came from the widow of Tutankhamun. On three counts, the request from Akasenamun has to be doubted. Firstly, Akasenamun was a young female, and they were not normally given great authority within Egypt. Would she be allowed to make such a decision which would have made had major ramifications on the future role of the monarchy? It is believed that at this time in Egypt, a senior official called Ai wielded great power. He actually became the next pharaoh. Would he have allowed the queen to carry on protracted negotiations with the Hittite king? Secondly, it had never been common Egyptian practice for princesses to marry foreigners. A generation or so earlier, Amenhotep III makes this clear in a letter. From time immemorial, no daughter of a king of Egypt is given to anyone. The request of Arkasen Amun goes against the Egyptian policy on marriage for its royal women. Thirdly, it is difficult to fathom the strategic logic behind the request of the Egyptian queen. When you are at war with a foreign power, 
You do not offer them your kingdom by making your enemy's son your king. Basically, Akasanaman was handing the kingdom of Egypt on a plate to Superlulamus. There is one Elamana letter from Superlulamus, reference EA 41. It is addressed to Hariah, the king of Egypt, my brother. The name of the king is corrupted and could be any of the Amana pharaohs. The sender is clearly a Superlulamus and he is a king, but the tablet is damaged so that it is not clear if he was the king of Hattai. The letter, EA 41, is written to a son shortly after the death of his son and recounts the friendly relations between the sender and the recipient's father. The wish is for the, the state of peace and friendship to continue. The text also records several gifts sent with the letter. In the Hittite document, The Deeds of Superlulamus, the emperor is astounded by the approach from the Egyptian queen. He cannot remember friendly relations with Egypt, but he is told that long before his time, Hattai and Egypt were friendly. There is therefore no time in the life of Superlulamus when such a friendly letter as EA 41 could have been written. Any Hittite references to Egypt in the time of Superlulamus are concerned with warlike relations. The Hittite record completely contradicts the content of EA 41. The, writ the letter was written by a Superlulamus, but this could not have been Hem Hittite Emperor Superlulamus I. Now it is clear from the letters of the King of Cyprus that the island was an independent state during the time of the Amarna letters. Now this was stressed by Vassos Cari Georgius, director of antiquities in Cyprus, in his book Cyprus from the Stone Age to the Romans. The correspondence between the king of Alatia and his allies, the pharaoh of Egypt and the king of Ugarit, would suggest that Alatia was independent. Now this is in conflict with the Hittite records of the time of Superlulamus I. The Hittite king, Arnawandus, the first who lived about 30 years before Superlulamus states that Cyprus was under Hittite rule. The land of Alatia belongs to my majesty, CTH 147. Now throughout the Amman letters, Azuru is a loyal vassal of the king of Egypt. Historians can point to an implication in the treaty with Superlulamus that Azuru changed sides. Azuru knelt down at the feet of my majesty and came from the gate of Egyptian territory. Now this cannot mean that Azura changed from loyalty to Egypt to Hittite vassalage because there is an unequivocal statement in a later Hittite treaty with Amru that states that Azura was a subject of the king of Huri before he had changed his allegiance to Hattai. The Azuru and Atacama of the Amarna letters had different allegiances to the Azuru and Atacama of the Hittite treaties. It cannot be argued that they both changed sides. Although individuals with these names feature in both the records of Superlulamus and in the Amarna letters, the information about them is contradictory. From the information in the Amarna letters, the land of Amaru appears to have been centred around Baalbek and Damascus. The kings of Amaru had close links with the coastal towns of Beirut, Sidon and Tyre, which were to the west or southwest of Baalbek and Damascus. The Hittite records locate Amru further north according to the treaty between Superlulamus I and Azuru. Amru bordered on Mukish, the Amark Plain, Kinsa on the southern Orontes, and Nuhasa south of Carchemish. Now this locates it north of Kaili, Syria on the middle of Orontes, somewhere close to Hamath. Names of kings can be useful, but without conf confirmatory actions, they should be treated with caution. Five Hittite rulers called Superlulamus are known. Two from the New Kingdom and three from the Neo-Hittite period. The name Azuru appears several times in his Hittite Syrian history. Now as we can see from, the, from this evidence, the view that the Superlulamus of the Amarna letters is the Hittite Emperor Superlulamus I is not the rock-solid smoking gun is assumed by those who support the conventional view that Dynasty 18 was immediately followed by Dynasty 19. 
Now the next piece of evidence used to show Dynasty 19 closely followed Dynasty 18 is archaeological evidence showing Greek Late Hellenic 3B pottery as contemporary with Dynasty 19. Now on the top row of this chart you can see Greek Mycenaean pottery labelled Late Hellenic 3A that is associated with the archaeological age known as Late Bronze 2A and it is contemporary with Dynasty 18. Now it is solidly locked in as contemporary with the late 18th dynasty as it was abundantly found at Akhenaten's city Akhetaten, also known as El Amarna, which was abandoned as a capital after Akhenaten's reign. Now this solidly links the late 18th dynasty with late Hellenic 3A pottery as they've been abundantly found together in Egypt. This pottery is associated with the late bronze 2A. Now always immediately above that is chronologically after Late Hellenic 3A in Greek sites is pottery known as Late Hellenic 3B which is associated with the archaeological age known as Late Bronze 2B as you can see in the second row of this chart. Now following Late Bronze 2B comes the Iron Age which conventionally starts around 1200 BC and is conventionally believed to be contemporary with Ramses III and the 20th dynasty. Now this date of 1200 BC marks the beginning of the Greek and Anatolian Dark Ages where virtually nothing is known until 750 BC. Now Velikovsky believed that this Dark Age gap was artificially created by applying Egypt's faulty chronology outside of Egypt. Velikovsky believed that the end of the Late Bronze Age should be lowered to 750 BC. Now regardless of which date you give for the end of the Late Bronze, either the conventional date of 1200 BC, David Roll's date of about 850 BC, or Velikovsky's revised date of 750 BC, there is only one subdivision of the Late Bronze Age that is between the Late 18th Dynasty and the end of the Late Bronze Age. That's the one in the second row called Late Bronze 2B. Now following that last subdivision of the Late Bronze Age comes Iron Age 1 and then on Iron Age 2. Now it's in Iron Age 2 where Velikovsky places the 19th dynasty some 150 years plus after the end of the 18th dynasty. So if the 19th dynasty followed immediately after the 18th dynasty then the Greek pottery that should be found with Egyptian 19th dynasty material should be late Hellenic 3b. Following on from that the 20th dynasty should be found together with Iron Age 1 pottery if Manetho's sequence of dynasties is correct. Now if however the 19th dynasty was as claimed by Velikovsky separated from and was 150 plus years after the 18th dynasty then the pottery that should be found with Egyptian 19th dynasty material should be Iron Age 2 pottery. So is Greek late Hellenic 3B pottery really contemporary with dynasty 19 as claimed by conventional chronology and revisionist chronologists such as David Roll or is this connection based on faulty assumptions? What evidence do we have for connecting late Hellenic 3B pottery directly with the 19th dynasty? Well, Alan Montgomery, in an article entitled Roll's Critique, addresses the claims of David Roll, who says the archaeology and pottery finds support the conventional order of dynasties. He writes, According to Martha Bell, Gurub to tomb 605 starts out as possibly the best dated vase context for late Hellenic 3b in Egypt. This is supported by a Mycenaean stirrup jar F182 that is popular in late Hellenic 3b1 and late Hellenic 3b2. Now the vase came from a casket found in the tomb. It was accompanied by a scarab fingering of user Matre set penray as well as an ungoat box, headrest, walking stick, pottery dish and two wooden chapties which were recognised as belonging to the early 19th dynasty. Now this seems to be a straightforward archaeological association of ramicide material with a Mycenaean ceramic. 
However, Bell continues, your up term 605, seemingly so secure, has areas of ambiguity upon careful examination. What does she mean? Well, firstly, the coffin found in tomb 605 has a black background with yellow decoration. Now, this decoration developed in the mid 18th dynasty and has no examples of this coffin style are found in the 19th dynasty. Now, how may these anomalies be explained? Now, suppose the Gurub tomb 605 and its objects represented a period starting shortly after the end of the 18th dynasty. Now suppose also the 22nd dynasty followed the 18th dynasty and that the styles in the late 18th dynasty were continued. Then the 18th dynasty coffin and the jewelry box can be found in early 22nd dynasty where the pottery would be later Laddic 3B1. Use a matre set a penre on the scarab fingering is also the pronomen of Shoshenk the third who reigned 823 to 773 BC, and also Osakon II, who ruled even earlier, and thus does not belong to the 19th dynasty, and thus neither the scarab fingering nor the late Hellenic 3B pottery found at Gurub belongs to Ramses II. This resolves the above dating ambiguities and shows the best dated vase of late Hellenic 3B in Egypt does not belong to the reign of Ramses II. So notice carefully here a very important point that Alan brings out here. The prenomen name of Ramses II is Yuzumatre Setep Penre. Now this same prenomen name is not unique to Ramses the Great, but was also the prenomen of at least three of the Libyan pharaohs. Now because this prenomen name was shared by several pharaohs, there needs to be more evidence than just a cartouche with the name of user Matre said to Penre to lock an object or strata to belonging to that of Ramses the Great. Now continuing on, Alan writes, At Tel Afik, the Egyptian residence in level X12 was destroyed in the late Bronze II. The destruction in level X12 is ascribed to the later part of Ramses II, partly because of the pottery. Level X12 tombs contain typical late Aladdin 3 pottery, but what of Ramses II? What evidence is there that Ramses II lived during level X12? Well, in a stone trough outside the gates of level X12 residence, a scarab of Yuzumatre set to Penre was found. Now the conventional view claims that it is the 13th century, thus Yuzumatre said to Penre is Ramses II. But the Tor Velikovsky view is that the ninth, it is the 9th century, and thus the name is a Libyan pharaoh, possibly Osikon II and Shishonk III, who, like Ramses II, were also known as Yuzumatre said to Penre. Now there is also a plaque of Ramses II. Now, has it now been established that Ramses II is associated with late Hellenic three pottery? Well, not exactly. Most scholars have associated the plaque with the destruction of the Egyptian residence, but in fact it was not found in that stratum. It was actually found in a silo of iron two. It is possible that the residence destruction level may be associated with the late 18th dynasty or the 22nd dynasty. This would explain why the Ramses II plaque was found in Iron II. This would require changing the order of the dynasties. If the letter and D stem is actually 1st millennium, it means that Late Bronze II and the Scarab of Yuzumatre Seta Penre is possibly 9th century. Then the Libyan dynasty could be placed in Late Bronze IIb, including Destruction Level X12, and Iron I. Then Ramses II is iron two, and all of this is within the Tor Velikovsky model. The association of Mycenaean pottery and the 19th dynasty has not held up. When late Hellenic 3b appears on a site such as at Tel Afek and Gurub, it is assumed to be the time of the 19th dynasty, and the scarabs of Yuzumatre are credited to Ramses II rather than a Libyan pharaoh. 
When artifacts of, of Ramses II and Seti I appear in Iron II strata at Beth Shan and Tel Afik, it is assumed that they came from Late Bronze II strata and were somehow moved. The sum effect of these assumptions is that the accepted dynastic order of Manetho is true, yet no indisputable examples exist. Roll cannot therefore merely recite the opinion of Egyptology against Velikovsky's theory. He must revisit this material and provide reasonable explanations. So let's now take a look at the genealogical evidence used to support the conventional order of dynasty. Now Bimson in his 2003 SIS review article, Finding the Limits of Chronological Revision, writes, so what was this emerging evidence that finally proved fatal to the Glasgow chronology? All kinds of solutions were tried, overlapping dynasties, overlapping reigns to shorten the dynasties, looking for duplicate reigns that could not be removed, could be removed, but nothing would yield the drastic compression of Egyptian history that was needed. For example, two genealogies run all the way from the reign of Ramses II through the third intermediate period to the 26th dynasty, in one case to the reign of Samtik I, in the other to the reign of Nico II. These alone rule out any possibility of making the third intermediate and Sayite periods contemporary. Well, let's look at these genealogies and see how well they support the conventional order of dynasties. Now, David Roll describes one of these, which is the genealogy of the royal architects. Now, to the right of the main body of the inscription is a short label text which dates the document to the 26th year of the Persian king Darius I. The author of the inscription is the royal architect Kenembre, son of Amos Sinate. Year 26 of Darius I can be securely dated to 496 BC. The text of Kenembre's inscription extends backwards over an amazing 22 generations to the well-attested Rahotep, vizier of Egypt during the first half of the reign of Ramses II. We can surely identify the royal architect Haremsaf, dated in the genealogy to circa 776 BC, as the royal architect Haremsaf, whose son inscribed the Stella 100 of Shoshank I at Gibel as Silsilia quarries. Well, the only thing in this genealogy that on the surface conflicts with Velikovsky's view of the Libyan dynasties reigning in between the 18th and 19th dynasties is Rahotep at the very bottom there. Now, if he is the architect from the 19th dynasty and this genealogy is legit, then the 19th dynasty would have come before the 22nd dynasty and not after as claimed by Velikovsky. Now, David Roll says that this royal architect surely must be the Rahotep, who was the vizier during the reign of Ramses the Great. Well, the only thing that supports that is the similarity of a singular name, Rahotep. Now, in this genealogy alone, there are three Tajen Bayus and four Nestafnuts. So, I think we need a little more proof before we identify this Rahotep with one who was a contemporary of Ramses the Great. Now another genealogy is the Memphite genealogy, also known as the Berlin Block genealogy. Now the Berlin Block genealogy of priests leaves little room in between Dynasty 18 and Dynasty 19 and argues that Dynasty 19 followed soon after. Now this evidence is perhaps the closest thing to a smoking gun arguing for Dynasty 19 to have ruled straight after Dynasty 18. So on this list here, you can see that chronologically, Priest 211 is under Amenhotep III of the 18th dynasty. Priest 210 is under A of the, of the 18th dynasty. 28 is under Haramhab. And Priest 27 is under Seti I of dynasty 19. Now based on this data, it appears that the two dynasties were close to each other and not separated as claimed by Velikovsky. Now one thing to note on this chronology is that there are no 20th dynasty kings listed. So just how much stock can we place in these genealogies? Well Bob Porter commenting on such genealogies wrote, 
perhaps the genealogy should not be taken too seriously. As even today, it is possible to buy oneself an impressive genealogy with little factual basis. The possibility of a Memphite priest knowing his genealogy way back to the 11th, 11th dynasty seems highly improbable, or was he just cheating to get some extra status? It is therefore even stranger that no priest served under kings of the 20th dynasty. According to jean frederic Brunet, citing MIA, there was a series of Apis bulls buried under kings of Dynasty 20. These burials were spread between Dynasty between Ramses III and Ramses XI. The dearth of burials is from the incumbents comprising Dynasty 21. Now, Alan Montgomery, in a personal email to me, made these comments about such genealogical evidence, including the Berlin block. He wrote, Genealogies. These are tricky things because they are typically ego things rather than historical. Many genealogies use Pappy naming, naming a son after the grandfather, making identities difficult. Unless some verification of genealogies can be made, I do not consider their evidence strong enough to invalidate other evidence. The Berlin block is one example where many names are unverified and many known high priests are omitted. It is unreliable. I would date it to the 3rd or 2nd century and may have influenced Manetho's dynastic order. In Manetho's day, they were unable to piece together a lot of Ethiopian Egyptian history. Now, further to this, Alan writes the following in his article, A Chronological Model of the 1st and 2nd Millennium BC. Manetho is supported by the Berlin genealogy. The Berlin genealogy lists almost 50 high priests of Tar from the Middle Kingdom to the Third Intermediate Period. Some panels show the reign of the pharaoh in which the priest was inaugurated. Unfortunately, this genealogy claims that every high priest was a son of the previous high priest. Now, since we know that the Libyan pharaohs gave the appointment of the high priest of Tar to a new family in the middle of their dynasty, this cannot be true. Thus, the Berlin genealogy is not a true genealogy. If the Berlin block genealogy is a late composition written hundreds of years after the 18th and 19th dynasty, then there is certainly room for error. It may be that such error misled Manetho, or this genealogy was misled by Manetho, who may have erred with the dynastic order. Now, there are a couple of other pieces of genealogical evidence that are used to support the conventional order of dynasties. There is a record of a lawsuit over four generations recorded in the Memphite tomb chapel of Mosi. Now, this refers to a woman called Sheritri, who lived in the time of the enemy from Akhetaten in the Amarna period and whose appeal had been heard in year 18 of Ramses II. Now this is used as evidence to support the view that the 19th dynasty of Ramses II came soon after Pharaoh Akhenaten. However, that is not necessarily the case. When it says the enemy of Akhetaten, it is not the Pharaoh Akhenaten, but it is referring to the city of Akhetaten. Now Akhetaten, while abandoned as a capital in Tutankhamun's reign, was probably still inhabited for quite some time afterwards. Now John Bimson claims that the family of ne Neferhotep at Del Air Medina in a document contains a genealogy over a small number of generations that starts with Dynasty 18 and goes through to Dynasty 20. Now this however seems to conflict with one leading authority on this site. In his uh, 375 page authoritative work on Deir el Medina, entitled Who's Who at Deir el Medina, Benedict Davies states, our first solid documentation from the village of Deir el Medina arises at the dawn of a new era in Egyptian history, the 19th dynasty, more than 250 years after the foundation of the settlement. So while the town appears to have been in existence during the 18th dynasty, the solid documentation of the site begins with the 19th dynasty. Now the connection here between the 18th and 19th dynasties for the 
time that Neferhotep lives between is on the basis of assuming that Haramhab in the genealogy is an 18th dynasty pharaoh. The various copies of Manetho have Haramheb ruling after Tutankhamun's successor Ai, but it is unclear whether he is the last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, or the first king of the 19th dynasty, or some in-between ruler. There is no direct explicit evidence connecting Haramheb to the 18th dynasty. Velikovsky argued that he was contemporary with Taharka of the 25th dynasty, and places him immediately prior to the 19th dynasty pharaohs reigning during the 7th century BC. Now, Alan Montgomery summarizes the evidence for this. He writes, Let us first consider the evidence that convinced Velikovsky that Haramheb was not a member of the 18th dynasty, but ruled at the end of the 8th century during the conflict between Ethiopia and Assyria. First, Haramheb is seen on an inscription together with the Ethiopian prince Taharka before he became pharaoh. Velikovsky believed it was the same person as pharaoh Haramheb. Now, Haramheb's name in a royal katush appears also on the outside of a Theban tomb of Petamenophis, which is in the style of the Ethiopian age. A more important example of Haramheb's connection to the late Libyans is the appearance of his cartouche on the shoulder of, of high priest of Amun king's son Shishonk Meriman, which was excavated in Saqqara by Badawi. In conjunction with the evidence above, this Libyan must be the son of Osikon IV. Haramheb's Memphis tomb shows him receiving the dominion over Egypt from a king whose name has been erased. It is unclear why he is receiving the dominion of the land from another ruler. He was neither the son of a pharaoh nor a member of the royal family. A translator was present to interpret the words of the king to Haramheb. Now the conventional view has him appointed by Tutankhamun. Now, if this were true, why does he need a translator? And why is it that Pharaoh A succeeded Tutankhamun and not Haramheb? Velikovsky concluded that the person appointing Haramheb was a foreigner, and thus neither Tutankhamun nor A. At that time, the, Assyrians and, the Ethiopians and Assyrians were warring to gain control over Egypt. An Assyrian king who had captured Egypt used the translator to communicate to Haramheb. Now there is other evidence that ties the tomb of Haramheb to the time of the 25th and 26th dynasties. In Haramheb's tomb is a scene in which foreigners of various countries have come or have been forced to come to pay their respects to Haramheb. Now among these foreigners are Aegeans who first arrived in Egypt in the 7th century. Martin comments, to find Aegeans represented at this period at the end of Tutankhamun or I in an Egyptian tomb is unprecedented. So while appearing very convincing at first sight, there are problems with each of these pieces of genealogical evidence used to support the conventional view that Dynasty 18 was immediately followed by Dynasty 19. Now apart from Manetho's list of kings, there are other kings lists. Can any of these perhaps help us in our quest to determine the correct order and placement of kings and whether Dynasty 18 was immediately followed by Dynasty 19 or not? Well, the king list at Abydos was carved at the time of Seti I and Ramses the Great. Now, it does not have any Libyan or Ethiopian kings in between Dynasty 18 and Dynasty 19, but there are other kings missing on this list as well. Now, Geoffrey Gammon, who believes that Dynasty 19 followed straight after Dynasty 18, was honest enough to admit the following. The position is complicated by the fact that the king lists, which have survived from Dynasty 19, ignore the Amarna pharaohs and name Haramheb as the immediate successor of Tutmos IV and Amenhotep III with Ramses I and Seti I following Haramheb. Now, since Akhenaten, Semenkare, Tutankhamun and A are excluded as uncanonical, 
it would be reasonable to assume that the Libyan and Ethiopian kings would similarly be omitted from the Abydos and Saqqara kings list had they intervened. No conclusions can therefore be drawn from their absence from these lists. Now David Roll believes that there is structural evidence at the Bubastite portal at the Temple of Karnak arguing that the Libyan dynasties followed both the 19th and 20th dynasties. Now Eric Hatcherson summarizes this evidence and offers a counter-argument to this point. He writes, The Bubastite portal as described by Roll is wedged or squeezed in between a pylon wall built by Ramses II and a freestanding temple built by Ramses III. My following depiction tries to follow David Roll. The chronological importance of the Bubastite portal to David Roll's quoted point is what it covers up or crowds out. That portion which abuts the Ramses II wall crowds out a cartouche of that king. Thus it is argued that the Shishonk Bubastite portal was erected subsequent to Ramses II and Ramses III. It is of some interest, however, that Roll does not mention the, this other person involved on this portal. He is, I put, the son of Shoshank I. His cartouche and statue adorn the other side of the portal and requires our attention to the argument of where elsewhere the portal stood. A photo from Google indicates why I think the iput ad additions are very important. Please note the disfigurement of those items on the left of the facade that abuts the wall against which the portal has been squeezed. Note also that there are distinct breaks between the sections of the hieroglyphics that no self-respecting architect would accept. The same can be said of the following photo, photo that shows the clipping of the foot of iput. In my opinion, if Iput had set his artist to add this detail to the averse of his father's monument, then he would expect those artists to balance the scene within the confines of the space available. No artist would create this photograph scene willingly. The implications of these scenes involving Iput indicate that the original structure was dismantled and only the portal was cut to fit in the space between the two projects initiated by either of the attested Ramses. This portal was not built in the position in which we currently find it. So it would appear from the iput evidence that the blocks from wherever the Bubastite portal and its attendant structures were, were cut down to fit into the space between the walls of the existing structures. The point to make is that once it is accepted that knocking down and rebuilding was a common occurrence and sometimes nothing was later deemed sacred such as the red granite colossus of Ramses II built into a Shishonk III pylon at Tanis, then it becomes very difficult to draw irrefutable chronological conclusions from the structures that we see today. And a quote. Now Peter James, John Bimson, David Roll and others maintain the conventional order of dynasties for the New Kingdom. They have presented a number of points and arguments against change in the conventional order of dynasties for the New Kingdom period. Now while those arguments carry a certain amount of weight, they are certainly not the smoking gun those using this evidence would like us to believe. I've gone through the key arguments here and personally believe that the counter arguments are reasonable without clutching at straws. So that concludes lecture five. In the next lecture, we will hear from the defense, the evidence supporting a gap between the two dynasties before I give my concluding comments based on who I believe has best argued their case. Now, welcome everybody to the sixth lecture in this series on the Bible in Egypt in search of a correct Egyptian chronology. Now in the previous lecture I went through the evidence presented by scholars such as David Roll, Peter James, John Bimson and others arguing against separating dynasties 18 and 19 by 150 years as proposed by Emmanuel Velikovsky. Now while those arguments carry a certain amount of weight, I felt after going through the evidence that they are certainly not the smoking gun by those using the evidence would like us to believe. I went through the key arguments and personally believe that the counter arguments are reasonable without clutching at straws. 
Now in this lecture we're going to look further at the squeeze of dynasties problem I have referred to in previous lectures and look at the evidence arguing for a gap of 150 years between dynasties 18 and 19 as proposed by Velikovsky. Now let's briefly look at what we'll be covering in this lecture. Now as far as the evidence for a gap between the, the dynasties, we're going to start with looking at synchronisms that lock dynasties 18 and 19 in time around 150 years apart from each other. After that, we're going to take a look at the dating gaps in Turkey which appear to show that dynasty 19 is dated over 600 years too early. And then we'll look at further evidence that argues for the gap before I draw my final conclusions as to which chronology best fits the archaeological evidence. Now virtually all revisionist chronologists agree with the conventional chronology that Egypt's chronology from the 25th dynasty to its 31st dynasty prior to the conquest of Alexander is mostly fixed and settled. The 25th dynasty can be cross-checked with Assyrian data and is dated around 700 BC. Now David Roll, Peter James, John Bimson and others maintain the conventional order of dynasties for the New Kingdom. Now they have presented a number of points and arguments against changing the conventional order of dynasties for the New Kingdom period. Now in the third volume of his Ages and Chaos series, Ramses II in his time, Velikovsky shocked many of his followers by placing Ramses the Great in the 7th century BC and arguing that the 18th and 19th dynasties were separated by about 150 years with the Libyan and Ethiopian dynasties 22 to 25 ruling in between them. Now again, Velikovsky used predominantly synchronistic evidence in placing Ramses the Great in the 7th century BC showing a running string of coincidences in the war annals of Ramses the Great and those of the pharaoh known as Nico in the Bible who contested for control of Syria and Palestine with Nebuchadnezzar. So now what evidence is there supporting a separation of dynasties 18 and 19 and having the Libyan and Ethiopian dynasties ruling in between them? Well let's now go through that evidence and see how strong it is compared to the evidence of retaining Manetho's order of dynasties. Now after comparing and contrasting the differing views, the matching evidence, in my opinion, for the identity of the biblical Shishak goes to Tutmos III of the mid-18th dynasty. And the best evidence for the time of the Elamana letters of the late 18th dynasty, I felt, was the time of Jehoram, king of Judah. Now this evidence appears to lock in the end of the 18th dynasty shortly before 800 BC. Now the 25th dynasty is known to have ruled around 700 BC. Hezekiah's contemporary Taharka of the Ethiopian 25th dynasty began his rule in 690 BC and this is locked in by other synchronisms with Sennacherib of Assyria. Now it's not much time to fit in all those other dynasties. Now Velikovsky argued that the 19th dynasty ruled at the same time that the conventional chronology places the 26th dynasty which started about 660 BC. Now amongst those who believe that the 19th dynasty ruled as late as that, some argue that the 19th and 26th dynasties ruled parallel at the same time. Velikovsky on the other hand argued that they were one and the same dynasty and were duplicated by Manetho. Now there are pros and cons for both views which I will look at later in this lecture. So how strong is the evidence used to place Ramses the Great and the 19th dynasty around 600 BC? Well Velikovsky pointed to a number of running coincidences between the military chronicles of Ramses II and Pharaoh Nico's campaigns in the Bible. Now in 2 Chronicles 35 verses 20 to 24 we read, After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. But he sent messengers to him, saying, What have I to do with you, king of Judah? I do not come against you today, but against the house with which I have war. 
for God has commanded me to make haste. But Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguise himself so that he might fight with him in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died. Now, according to both sources, the war records started with a campaign across Palestine into northern Syria. On his march, Ramses II met resistance from a Palestinian king, and his archers killed the opposing kings, as seen on an Egyptian mural in the Metropolitan Museum of Art from the temple of Ramses II. Now in 2 Kings 23 verses 33 to 34 describes what Necho did next. And Pharaoh Necho put him, that is Josiah's son Jehoaz, in bonds at Riblah in the land of Hamath, so that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he put the land to a tax of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in place of Josiah his father and he changed his name to Jehoiakim and took Jehoahaz away and he came to Egypt and died there now we also know that Ramses II also established a camp and outpost at Riblah in the land of Hamath that's noted from an inscription of his second year at Nariel Kib now from this campaign he brought back captives of the royal house of Palestine now an obelisk of Tanis records Ramses II carrying off the princes of retinue, which is an ancient name for Palestine. He imposed a tribute on the land, according to an obelisk of Tanis. Now, Nico then launched a second campaign, which included the Battle of Carchemish. Now, the battle took place in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, according to Jeremiah 46, verse 2 who was made a vassal king in Necho's first year. Hence, the second campaign occurred four years after the first campaign. Now, the fourth year of Jehoiakim, when the major battle of Kadesh was fought, was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, according to Jeremiah 25 and verse 1. Now, Necho II's second campaign occurred three to four years after the first campaign. Ramses II's first campaign occurred in the second year of his reign, according to his inscription at Riblah. And Ramses II left Egypt on his second campaign late in his fifth year, which included the Battle of Carchemish. So Ramses II's second campaign occurred three years after his first campaign. Now, as a direct result of the Pharaoh's retreat from Kadesh Carchemish, According to Velikovsky, Palestine was conquered by Babylon and was under its control. Now those years following the defeat of the Egyptians correspond to the period from the 5th to the 8th year of Jehoiakim. We read in 2 Kings 24 verse 1, In his days Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Now, according to the Egyptian sources, Palestine was in revolt from the end of the fifth to the eighth or ninth year of Ramses' reign. Now, Jehoiakim rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar after three years. The Pharaoh came up out of Egypt. The land of the Philistines also fell to the Egyptians. Jeremiah 47 and verses 1 and 5 says, The word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah the prophet about the Philistines before Pharaoh's attack on Gaza. The hair is cut from the head of Gaza. Ashkelon has come to nothing. Now Ashkelon was stormed in the ninth year of Ramses II according to a bas relief on an outer wall of the great hypostyle hall at Karnak. Now, if Ramses II and Nebuchadnezzar were contemporaries, then Ramses' ninth year was the eighth year of Jehoiakim, and the siege of Ashkelon by Ramses was coincident with the revolt by Jehoiakim. Now, Judah was likely retaken first by Necho before he conquered Philistia. 
Now, David Roll, in trying to equate Ramses II with Shishak, tells us that in the Ramesseum, that Ramses II entered Jerusalem in his eighth year. So Ramses, or Nico, takes Judah back in his eighth year, and then his Philistia campaign comes after that in his ninth year. Now in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 5 and 6, we read, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. He was ruling in Jerusalem for 11 years, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and took him away in chains to Babylon. So Jehoiakim rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar in his eighth year, but it's not until three years later in Jehoiakim's eleventh year that Nebuchadnezzar comes to deal with his rebellion. Now his son Jehoiachin then became king for three months and did what was evil. Nebuchadnezzar came up against Jerusalem again and like his father took him away to Babylon, replacing him with Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. Now Breasted notes that Ramses II and the Egyptians retreated under the pressure of the kings of the north and Palestine was lost by Egypt a second time. Now this would correspond to years 10, 11 and 12 of, of Nico or Ramses when Judah was under Egyptian control before Babylon took control of Judah in Nico, Ramses' 12th reignal year. Now in his ninth year, Zedekiah revolted and Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem. As it says in 2 Kings 25 verse 1. Now Jeremiah 37.5 then tells us, And Pharaoh's army had come out from Egypt, and the Chaldeans who were attacking Jerusalem, hearing news of them, went away from Jerusalem. So the armies of the Chaldeans withdrew from Jerusalem to meet the Egyptian army. But Jeremiah told Zedekiah in Jeremiah 37 verses 7 and 8, The Lord, the God of Israel, has said, Pharaoh's army, which has come out to your help, will go back to Egypt to their land. And the Chaldeans will come back again and make war against this town, and they will take it and put it on fire. Now Zedekiah, hoping for Egyptian support, rebelled against Babylon. The Egyptians came out, but then returned to their country. Nebuchadnezzar then went back to Jerusalem and renewed the siege. So it was quite likely that an agreement was made between the two empires with Egypt yielding Syria and Palestine to Nebuchadnezzar, leaving Jerusalem without support. Now an agreement between Babylon and Egypt was reached near the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem, where Egypt acquiesced with the loss of Palestine in return for its own safety from the Babylonians and its own sovereignty. The Egyptians were accused of being a staff of reed in the, to the house of Israel in Ezekiel 29.6. Now the siege began in Zedekiah's ninth year, which was, which was Nebuchadnezzar's 17th year. Now if Ramses II was Nico II, then it would have been the 21st year of Ramses the Great. Now in the same year of Ramses the Great's reign, his 21st year, we know that he made a treaty with the Hittites. Now, according to Barry Kernock, Egypt fought against both Babylon and the Hittites at Carchemish, if it was one and the same battle, as Ramses II's loss at the Battle of Kadesh. Now, there was a new king at this time of the Hittite Empire, and he took advantage of the new peace agreement between Egypt and Babylon to initiate another peace treaty between Egypt and Egypt's other old enemy, the Hittites. Now here is a chart showing all these running synchronisms and the back and forth battle between Ramses the Great and Nebuchadnezzar, according to Velikovsky. So first of all, Judah starts off as a vassal of Egypt at the time of Josiah, who foolishly went out to battle Ramses the Great and lost his life, at which time one of his sons was taken away and another set up as, as Egypt's vassal king. Now three years later, Egypt loses Judah, following the loss at the Battle of Carchemish. Three years after that, Judah rebels against Babylon and turns to Egypt, and Ramses II in his eighth year brings Judah back under his control 
and conquers Philistia in his next year. Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of Jehoiakim's 11-year reign, then deals with him and reconquers Judah, taking both him and his successor to Babylon in chains and placing Zedekiah on the throne. Now, Breasted notes that Palestine was lost a second time from Ramses the Great to the kings of the north. Now, a decade later, Zedekiah then turned to the pharaoh for support, and then Nebuchadnezzar came out again to conquer Judah. Now, Ramses the Great came out to battle him, but then struck a deal to not support Judah with Nebuchadnezzar, who renewed the siege against Jerusalem. Now, very soon after the deal between Egypt and Babylon, the Hittites negotiated a treaty with Egypt. Now, Barry Kernock writes the following in relation to the Treaty of Ramses II, with the Hittites being dated at the same time as the treaty implied in the scriptures between Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon with Egypt. He writes, If the Babylonian kings were not the Hittite kings of the later New Kingdom, as proposed by Velikovsky, then the Hittite Empire must have existed independently of the so-called Neo-Babylonian Empire ruled by Nabopolassar and his descendants. There must be room in the history of the 6th century BC for both the Hittite and Babylonian kingdoms. In 605 BC, Nabopolassar was too ill to accompany the Babylonian army, which was entrusted to his son, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Merciless had died a few years before, and the new great king of Hattai, Moathtalus, was able to take command of the Hittite armies, aided by his younger brother. Now, etiquette, etiquette would have required that the great king of Hattai should now assume overall leadership in the absence of the great king of Babylon. The Battle of Carchemish and subsequent operations in Syria in 605 BC were under the overall control of Moathtalus. Both the great warriors Merciless and Nabopolassar had died, and it was left to the three young guns to finish what their fathers had started. The Hittite involvement at 605 BC explains the change of fortunes of the Babylonians. In the two previous years working alone, they had failed to gain any advantage over Egypt. It would require a larger force to dislodge the Egyptians from Syria, so the Allies once more planned a joint effort. The combined forces of Mawatalus and Nebuchadnezzar proved to be too much for the Egyptian army. In 612 BC against Nineveh and 609 against Haran, the Allied forces had won the day, combined with the Scythians and bringing an end to the Assyrian Empire. So it was in 605 BC at Carchemish. The Hittites would have no interest in the rest of Syria or Palestine or Phoenicia. Ribla would be the perfect base for the Babylonians to plunder these lands. It was beyond the land of Hamath, so would be under their control. But all the lands further north belonged to their great ally, the great king of Hattai. The Hittite Empire was not the same as the Neo-Babylonian Empire, as Velikovsky asserted. The two major powers were contemporaries and were allies in the conflicts against the Assyrian-Egyptian Axis. One of the first acts of Hattusilus after he became king was the stabilisation of relations with Egypt. A peace treaty was concluded with Ramses II in the pharaoh's 21st year, 16 years after the Battle of Kadesh. The need for Hattusilus to secure his hold on the throne of Hattai and to safeguard the succession is evident in the treaty with Ramses. The pharaoh committed to defending Hattusilus against foreign enemies, but also against his own subjects. The treaty between Hattusilus and Ramses makes no mention of the border between the two countries. Now, normally a border would state very normally a treaty would state very clearly which towns belong to which country. Why did the two great kings miss this opportunity to define the line of demarcation between them? Well the political situation in five eighty nine BC furnishes the answer. There was no border between Hattai and Egypt. The land of Hattai extended 
into northern Syria and included the land of Amaru. The Hittite ownership of Amaru is stated in the treaty. The land between the Hittite domain and Egypt was being contested by Ramses and Nebuchadnezzar, and therefore there was no statement in the treaty about the borders of Hattai and Egypt. Now, Velikovsky equated the Battle of Kadesh, where Ramses II fought against the Hittites, with the Battle of Carchemish fought between Pharaoh Necho with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, notice some of the similarities between the Battle of Kadesh fought by Ramses the Great and the Battle of Carchemish fought by Nebuchadnezzar against Egypt. Now, firstly, the Battle of Carchemish occurred three to four years after the first invasion of Palestine by Pharaoh Necho. The Battle of Kadesh was about three years after the first invasion of Palestine by Pharaoh Ramses the Great. Now, Carchemish means city of the god Chemosh. Now, being named after a deity, it was a holy city, or Kadesh. Now, in the palm of Pentor, from Ramses II's time, it states, In the land of Katai, Naren, Carchemish, Kedi, the land of Kamesh. Kadesh, implying a closeness between Carchemish and Kadesh. Now, Carchemish is north of Bab. Now, the field of the Battle of Kadesh was north of Bor, which is Bab of today. Now, on their way to Carchemish, Ramses passed through the town of Aranama, Aranama, which is Arima of today. Now, both of these towns are much further to the north than Tel Nebimen, the conventionally accepted location of Kadesh. Now, Carchemish had a fortress surrounded on all sides by water with a double wall and moats. It projects into the large stream nearby a sacred lake. Now, in Ramses' relief of the Battle of Kadesh, it is near a fortress that is surrounded on all sides by water, and the for fortress has a double wall and moats. It projects into a large stream with a, with a nearby sacred lake. Now, the allies of the Babylonians at Carchemish are the army of the Syrians, according to Jeremiah 35, verse 11. In the Battle of Kadesh, armies of the Syrian cities were on the side of the army of Hattai. Now, these Syrians are the Neo-Hittite city-states that were a part of the Hittite New Kingdom's empire. Now, Nico's army had four divisions. They were the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Lydians, according to Jeremiah 46. Now, of these, the Lydians from western Turkey were mercenaries, or hired men. Now, in Ramses the, Ramses the Great's army, there were also four divisions of Amun, Re, Tar, and Sutek. And mercenaries in the army were the Sadana, or the warriors from Sardis in Lydia. Now, in Jeremiah 46, verse 5, the following is said about Nico's army. Wherefore I have seen them dismayed and turned away back, and their mighty ones are beaten down, and are fled apace, and look not back. For fear was around about, says the Lord. They shall stumble and fall towards the north by the river Euphrates. Now Ramses the Great in his battle said that the infantry and chariotry of his majesty were discomfited before them whilst going northward. Now, summarising the string of coincidences between the wars of Nico and those of Ramses II, Alan Montgomery writes, Both Ramses II and Nico II encountered resistance at Megiddo and killed a local prince and took a local prince hostage, fought and lost a battle at Carchemish and made peace with the opposition 16 years later. And certainly, history repeats itself. Coincidences do happen, but there are here too many details and coincidences to dismiss these. They provide a solid basis to propose that Ramses II and Nico II are one and the same person. Now we see what appears to be a further duplication of two sets of kings, thought to be centuries apart, when we look at what the Greeks wrote about it, Egypt's history. Now Alan Montgomery writes, According to Herodotus, the father of Nico II was Somaticus. He was appointed pharaoh by the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. Now, Ashurbanipal was forced to acknowledge 
Egyptian independence because of his problems elsewhere. Now, as a result, Somaticus invaded Israel. He quickly ran into an army of Scythians. He made peace with the Scythian king by offering him the city of Bethshan. The Scythian king accepted. After that time, it became known as Scythiopolis, the city of the Scythians. It was still called Scythiopolis by Josephus in the first century AD. Now, despite the many military achievements of Symmachus and Nico II, not a single monument in Syria or Palestine has been attributed to either pharaoh. Neither has a single scab ever been found there in iron to strata. By identifying Symmachus and Nico II of the 26th dynasty, with Seti I and Ramses II of the 19th dynasty, the Velikovsky scheme provides the missing 7th century monuments and scarabs. Now, archaeology has indeed confirmed that Seti I and Ramses II of the 19th dynasty both had occupied Beth Shan and Israel. Now, the Scythians who Nico II's father met and were given Beth Shan appear in history not long after the captivity of the 10 tribes in Assyria. Now, historian Steve Collins tells us the following about the identity of these Scythians who originally ventured south to the land of Israel around 623 BC in the reign of Josiah and later would be part of the alliance with Babylon, the Hittites and the Medes in destroying the Assyrian capital Nineveh in 612 BC. Now, Herodotus notes that while the Scythians also conquered Media and took possession of all Asia, they marched into Palestine doing harm, doing no harm to anyone. Harper's Bible Dictionary records that this massive Scythian presence in Palestine occurred in the reign of King Josiah. The Scythian invasions clearly exhibit motives that confirm their Israelite origin. By conquering Media, they liberated the Israelites held captive in the cities of the Medes. And by destroying the Assyrian Empire, they exacted revenge for the Assyrian destruction on the old kingdom of Israel. Herodotus notes that while the Scythians also conquered Media and took possession of all Asia, they marched into Palestine doing no harm to anyone. Harper's Bible Dictionary records that this massive Scythian presence in Palestine occurred in the reign of King Josiah. The Scythian invasions clearly exhibit motives that confirm their Israelite origin. By conquering Media, they liberated the Israelites held captive in the cities of the Medes. And by destroying the Assyrian Empire, they exacted revenge for the Assyrian destruction of the old kingdom of Israel. The Greeks called the Black Sea Israelites Sarkae or Scythian. However, the Bible calls them by their Israelite tribal names because the Jews still recognize the Scythians as Israelite tribes. That is why in 2 Chronicles 34 and 35 records King Josiah issuing donation and Passover invitations to the people of Manasseh, Ephraim, Naphtali, Simeon and Israel. King Josiah was in fact interacting with the Saker Scythians who had just recently reoccupied their old tribal lands. Werner Keller states that the Scythians returned to the Black Sea region within 10 years, while Herodotus records they remained in the Middle East 28 years before ret returning. The events of King Josiah's reign take on new meaning when it is realized that the more devout 10 tribes of Israel had reoccupied Palestine during his reign. King Josiah's spiritual reform of Judah began in the 8th year of his reign. Now, the 8th year of his reign was 623 BC, about when the Sakai Scythians, the 10 tribes of Israel, reoccupied Palestine. Now, he began to destroy pagan idols and images, even though he did not recover the Book of the Law until at least 10 years later. Herodotus wrote that the Scythians avoided unclean meat and forbid the use of idolatrous images. After 10 to 28 years, the Israelites mostly returned to the north after discovering that Palestine was no more a land of milk and honey. It had been occupied by foreigners brought by Assyrians for a century and now was undesirable compared to the Israelites' Black Sea region. 
However, a few Israelites likely stayed in Palestine, accounting for limited contingents of Israelites being present in future generations. After the Scythian Israelites left Palestine, a city in the old tribal territory of Manasseh, Beth Shan, was renamed Scythiopolis in honor of the Scythians who had liberated Palestine from Assyrian domination. The city was still named Scythiopolis when it was one of the cities of the Decapolis in which Jesus walked. Now, in addition to the many similarities between the wars and battles of Nico and Ramses the Great, Emmanuel Velikovsky notes many examples in Ramses II and his time from archaeological finds which call for a redating of the 19th dynasty of Ramses the Great and the Hittite Empire. At Nar el Keb, near Beirut, cut in rock, next to the tablet of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, are carved commemorative tablets of Ramses II. Now, Samanicus, after the brief rule of his father, was Assyria's vassal king of Egypt. Assyria had difficulties elsewhere, and Egypt became independent. Yet the Egyptians, under Samanicus and Nico II, a.k.a. Seti and Alf Ramses the Great, were both loyal to Assyria, fighting by their side. So if Velikovsky is correct with equating Seti the Great's father, Nico I, with Ramses I, then Esarhaddon's father spared Ramses I, and Esarhaddon, in defeating the Ethiopians based at Thebes, could have been looked on by Ramses the Great as a liberator of Egypt from the Ethiopians and why he wanted to have his inscriptions left next to Esarhaddon's inscriptions. The accepted viewpoint is that Esarhaddon had his tablet carved close to those of Ramses II erected 600 years earlier. Now, if Velikovsky is wrong, why would Esarhaddon put his inscriptions next to an ancient pharaoh of one of his conquered countries? Now, the necropolis at Gordian of the Phrygian kingdom in Asia Minor was declared to belong to the 6th to the 7th century BC because of the Greek vases that were found there. Now, there were also found there hieroglyphic seals there, contemporary with the 13th century seals of Boghazkoi and the release of Yazilkaya. Now, the Phrygian layer at Gordian is actually under a clay level which is rich in imperial Hittite pottery. So the Hittite Empire must have existed at the same time or after the Phrygian Empire, according to Velikovsky. Now at Al Alisar, Hittite seals contemporary with those at Boghazkoi dated the 13th to the 13th century were found in stratum with Phrygian pottery and Greek vases which were clearly 6th and 7th century BC a 600 year difference now Barry Konok tells us the following about the development and use of seals in the Hittite Empire he writes in the conventional dating of the two Hittite periods where the kingdoms of Hattusas in central Turkey were followed centuries later by the Neo-Hittite civilization in northern Syria, the use of stamp seals is followed by the use of cylinder seals. Now this is actually opposite to the shift apparent in Assyria and Babylon of the first millennium. Cylinder seals were used in the 9th and 8th centuries and these were replaced by stamp seals in the 7th century. Now we have redated the New Hittite Empire period to the 7th century, we find that the use of seals by the Hittites parallels exactly the use in Assyria. Hittite cylinder seals are found in the Neo-Hittite settlements and date from the 9th and 8th centuries, and Hittite stamp seals from the time of Superlulamus, Mesulus and Mawatalus are from the 7th century. Now it should be noted that this problem regarding the development of seals with the conventional chronology of the Hittite Empire is not corrected by the chronologies of David Roll and Peter James who place Superlulamus, Mesulus and Mawatalus no later than the 10th century BC. Now Professor Ekrem Erkegal of the University of Ankara has stated today 
when he wrote this in 1961, despite all industrious archaeological exploration of the last decades, the period from 1200 to 750 for most parts of the Anatolian region lies still in complete darkness. The old nations of Asia Minor, like the Lycians and the Carians, are archaeologically, that is with their material heritage, first noticeable about 700 or later. Hence, the cultural remains of the time between 1200 and 750 in central Anatolia, especially on the plateau, seem to be quite ir irretrievably lost for us. Now, the Dark Age gap in Turkey is the same as in Greece from 1200 to 750 BC. Now, the difference in Turkey are the dating gaps, which are 150 years greater. Now, a dating gap is where the usual archaeological context implies one date, for example, contemporary with the late Assyrian Empire, yet the dating applied is centuries older. For example, imperial Hittite items found and its dating comes from the synchronism of the Hittite Treaty with Ramses II. Now, there are sites and strata with objects dated between 750 and 600 BC, which are dated by Assyrian chronology and have no artifacts from the Hittite Empire to confuse matters. Then we have other sites for that period which do have Hittite artifacts relatively dated to before Hattuslus III, who Ramses the Great made a treaty with. Now, the absolute dates applied to them are usually 600 plus years than the strata would normally be dated to without the Hittite artifacts. Now, I've shown previously that in Greece and Western Turkey, the Dark Age gap is consistently found to be around 450 to 500 years, which matches how far out the 18th dynasty dating is out if we accept Velikovsky's synchronism of Tutmos III with the biblical Shishak. In central Turkey and Syria, the Dark Age dating gap is consistently found to be over 600 years, and this is due solely to the dating of the Treaty of the 19th Dynasty Pharaoh Ramses the Great with the Hittites to the 1200s BC. Now, the difference in the dating gaps in Greece and Turkey of 150 years where one area obtains its absolute dates due to the conventional dating of the 18th Dynasty and the other due to the conventional dating of the 19th dynasty, can be explained if the two dynasties were separated by 150 years, as argued by Velikovsky. Now we've looked at the evidence of the Dark Age in Greece. Let's now take a look at the Dark Age in Turkey, seen in the archaeology of the Hittite Empire, which can only be properly closed by moving the reign of Ramses the Great some 600 years forward in time. Now, Bible critics in the 1800s scoffed at references in the Bible to a people called the Hittites, for which there was no archaeological proof for at that time. Now, their evaluation was that the Hittites were simply one of many mythical peoples fabricated by Bible writers, or at best, a small and unimportant tribe. Now, in 1876, at Carchemish on the Euphrates River, in monuments with unknown hieroglyphic characters were discovered that were similar in style to those in, found in north and central Turkey, and as far away as Smyrna and Hamath in Syria. In 1880, noted scholar Archibald Henry Sace announced his conviction that these monuments were to be attributed to the biblical Hittites. Now, further tablets were later found that would help with deciphering the unknown language and script. Now, in northern Turkey, a large site was uncovered at Boghazkoy, which was a huge ancient city with a wall five kilometres in circumference. Now, it was later identified as Hattusis, the capital of the Hittite Empire. At this site were uncovered thousands of Hittite documents. Now, amongst them, Hugo Winkler in 1906 discovered a Hittite comp copy of the same treaty between Ramses the Great and Hittite king Hattuselus III. Sace's conviction that the monuments were to be attributed to the Hittites was proven correct. Now the language of the imperial Hittites, to the great surprise of archaeologists, turned out to be Indo-European, that is the language group of much of Europe's Caucasian peoples. 
Now, this was a surprise given that Ephron the Hittite, who Abraham bought a burial plot from in Hebron, lived among the children of Heth, who was a son of the dark-skinned Canaan. Now, the oldest name for central Anatolia, land of the Hattai, was found on cuneiform tablets from the time of Sargon the Great, who lived in the early Bronze Age, a little bit before Abraham's time. Now, the Hebrew word for Hittite in the Bible is kite, K-H-I-T-T-E. Now, if you remove the vowels, you have K-H-T-T, which is very similar to Keta, the Egyptian word for the Hittites in Ramses II's day. Now, Wikipedia in its article about the Hittites says the following. Hittites serve as high military officers in David's army, such as Uri the Hittite, whose wife was Bathsheba. In 2 Kings 7 6, however, they are a people with their own kingdoms. The passage refers to kings in the plural. Apparently located outside geographic Canaan and sufficiently powerful to put a Syrian army to flight. It is a matter of considerable scholarly debate whether the biblical Hittites signify any or all of one, the original Haitians who spoke a non Indo European language, two, their Indo-European conquerors who retain the name Hattai for central Anatolia and are today referred to as the Hittites, or three, a Canaanite group who may or may not have been related to either or both of the Anatolian groups. Other biblical scholars have argued that rather than being connected with Heth, son of Canaan, the Anatolian land of Hattai was instead mentioned in Old Testament literature and apocrypha as Kittim, or Chittim, a people said to be named for a son of Javan. Now I'd like to now go through a number of extracts from a, an excellent article by Alan Montgomery called The Hittite Problem that does a terrific job explaining the problem of this archaeological dark age that is found in sites across both Greece and Turkey. Now Alan writes, thousands of Hittite clay tablets were discovered as the scholars decipher these texts, they came across a peace treaty with an, an Egyptian pharaoh named Ramses II, a mighty king of the 19th dynasty. The existence of the tre treaty was not news. The Egyptologists had found the Egyptian version of the treaty. The two treaties were compared and found to be the same. The treaty could now be firmly dated to the time of Ramses II of Egypt, the 13th century BC, over 600 years earlier than had been suspected. The Hittite annals, however, continue to provide problems rather than solve them. To start, the Hittite annals from the Belghazkoi archives show many similar features in style and expression to the Assyrian annals of the 7th century. The Assyrians also influenced the art of the ancient Hittites. An art expert expressed his opinion after studying the rock carvings at Yazilkaya and Boghaskoi that the Hittite art forms were the result of Assyrian innovations that were introduced into Mesopotamia in the 7th and 6th centuries BC and not before. The most prominent motives of Hittite art, he said, belonged to the 7th century and were not present in the art of even the late 8th century BC. Now about this the time that the archives of Boghazkoi were discovered, the city of Gordian to the west was excavated. Now the Phrygian king named Gordius, the father of the legendary king Midas, had built Gordian. At Gordian, the German excavators identified a stratum related to the time of King Midas. The East Greek pottery and terracotta were familiar to the Greek archaeologists and dated the stratum to the 8th century. However, it was pointed out that the site also contained Hittite pictographic hieroglyphics. Now, since these hieroglyphics were associated with the new Hittite Empire, which ended in the 13th century, the date of the stratum was put in doubt. The east-west pottery of the Gordian stratum had also been found at Belkhaskoi, and its chronological significance was also challenged. 
After World War II, the Americans under Young continued the excavation of Gordian. Now, the top stratum was clearly identified as belonging to the time of the Persians, starting from 548 BC. The third stratum was again identified as belonging to the Phrygians and dated to the 8th century. The Phrygian kingdom came to an end when the Sumerians had attacked it in 687 BC. Now, this left the second stratum sandwiched neatly between these two precise dates, 687 to 548 BC. The second stratum turned out to be a conundrum. It contained a copious amount of Hittite pottery and telltale pictographic hieroglyphics. Gordian strata read in the normal archaeological way would tell us that the new Hittite empire at Gordian rose following the chaos created by the Sumerians and the fall of King Midas and his Phrygian kingdom in 687 BC. That the Hittites expanded to the west, took over Gordian and held Lydia and Ashura in check. Then, a century later, the Hittites fell under the power of the Persians. That would again bring back the late 7th and early 6th centuries as the time of the new Hittite Empire. This must reflect back on the conclusions reached by the archaeologists, investigators of Bog Hazkoi, the site of the Hittite capital Hattuslis. Beetle and Gutebock excavated the Hittite capital of Hattusa in the 1930s. The top stratum, level 1, they found late Phrygian and post Phrygian ceramics, together with Greek language inscriptions evidence of the 7th and 6th centuries. There were also Hittite seals. In the next stratum, level 2, they found much Hittite pottery and Hittite seals with pictographic hieroglyphics of the Hittite Empire. This was evidence of the 13th century. But there was also East Greek pottery found in the levels of level 2. Among the 13th century Hittite items, there were pottery, which could not be dated earlier than the 8th, 7th century. Now eventually, more and more Hittite sites in Anatolia were excavated. In each case, strata that could not be dated earlier than the 8th century followed the Hittite stratum. This left a hole in the strata between 1200 BC, the end of the Hittite Empire, and 750 BC, the beginning of the Phrygian Kingdom. This gap was systemic all over Hittite territory. Taken at face value, this means that the total abandonment of the central plateau of Turkey that was the Hittite heartland for over 400 years. Neither the Hittites nor their enemies came to inhabit the Hittite land. Such a disappearance cannot be accepted without bringing the basic principles of stratigraphy into doubt. The problem, however, is not the stratigraphy or the archaeologists. The real problem is the unsynchronized state of the archaeological dating system, part of it dated by Greek and Assyrian chronology, and part dated to Assyrian chronology, without the two systems being themselves synchronized. Now, what evidence caused the archaeologists to date the Hittite Empire to the 13th century in complete defiance of all archaeological data. Well, the sole reason for this date was a treaty signed between Hattusilus III and Ramses II of the 19th dynasty of Egypt. Egyptian chronology places Ramses II firmly in the 13th century. This presupposes a complete and un unquestionable confidence in Egyptian chronology. Is such confidence justified? Well, to fix the problems in Hittite history and archaeology, the events, art and strata that date to the 13th century must be moved to the 7th century. This requires that the treaty between Ramses II and Hattusilus III be moved to the 7th century. In the Levant, there are also places where artefacts of Ramses II are found. The most famous, perhaps, is the tomb of Ahiram. The coffin of Ahiram is inscribed with the words, the coffin with which Ithabel, son of Ahiram, king of Gawal, that's Biblos, made for his father. The inscription is written in Hebrew script. The date of the Hebrew script was difficult to determine, but it is close to the one carved in a water tunnel during the reign of Hezekiah about the end of the 8th century. 
There was also Cypriot pottery found in the tomb dated to the 7th century by Desan. But the date of Ahiram's tomb was disputed. As well as 7th century Cypriot ware, there was also a 7th, 13th century vase with a cartouche of Ramses II. If Ramses II and Hattusilus III were placed in the 7th century, the Ahiram tomb evidence would be totally reconciled. At Beth Shan, Ramses II set up a steel dated to his ninth year, next to one of his father's city, the first. Now the content of the stealer is not so amazing as the context. The excavators found the, the Ramses Victory Stealer in Stratum 5. The pottery of St Stratum 5 was iron too. Now Stratum 4 belongs to the Neo-Babylonian and Persian Empire. Now the excavators having found a 13th century stealer in iron 2 postulated that somebody had thrown it up. That is, somebody removed it from stratum 7, where it belonged chronologically wise, and replaced it in stratum 5. Now, no historical accounts support this view, nor did any physical evidence. But without such an assumption, the excavators would be forced to challenge the opinion of Egyptologists and their chronology. This exposes the crux of the problem. The raw data of archaeology is conformed to Egyptian chronology by adding speculative assumptions that cannot be proven or disproved. This avoids directly challenging Egyptian chronology so that the 13th century dating of Ramses II continues. At Byblos, Bethshan, Lachish, Ugarit, Alalika and Katna, there is not a single stratum that dates from the latter 12th to the 8th century that lies above a stratum containing artifacts of Seti I or Ramses II. Everywhere artifacts of Ramses II are found in Palestinian and Syrian levels, either the stratum is dated to Iron II, or there is a hiatus of at least 500 years in the occupation of the site that follows immediately thereafter. The proposal to shift Ramses II and Hattusilus III to the 7th century fails to cause any stratification problems in, the, in the Israel, Phoenicia or Syria. In fact, it would close Dark Ages at many sites and resolve conflicts. The examination of Egyptian-related archaeology and history has produced the following problems. One. The date of Ramses II and his treaty with Hattusilus is incompatible with a range of 7th century chronological markers in the Hittite realm. 2. In Egyptian towns known to be inhabited in the 7th and 6th century, there are unexplained gaps where no dynasty after the 19th and before the 26th dynasties leaves any temples, statues or inscriptions. 3. There is a lack of monuments, stele, and historical inscriptions or papyri of the 7th century pharaohs of the 26th dynasty in Egypt, and in particular, Symmachus and Nico II and Hophra, despite the frequent mention of them in Greek records as mighty pharaohs. 4. The tombs and mummies for all 26th dynasty pharaohs are missing. 5. In a tomb at Byblos, a 13th century style coffin was made and inscribed by a 7th century Phoenician king in, the, in 7th century Hebrew script, while a Ramses II cartouche was found imprinted on a piece of pottery. 6. Monuments of Seti I and Ramses II are found in iron two strata at Lachish and Bethshan. 7. There are 600-year occupation gaps in cities with close links to Egypt, such as Byblos, Katna, and Ugarit. 8. There is a lack of artefacts of the 26th dynasty in the Iron II strata of Palestine and Syria, which should date to the time of Symmachus and Ramses II. 9. There is no mention of Seti the the first and Ramses the second in the literature of foreign countries, with the exception of the tri of the Hittites who made a treaty with Ramses the second. Ten. It is unexplained why the locations, sequences, and consequences of the battles of Ramses the second and Nico the second are coincidental. 
Now the problems found in Hittite land and those found in Egypt are different and yet they are similar. Thus 13th century objects appear in 7th century locations and 7th century objects appear in 13th century venues. Gaps and dark ages of five to 600 years occur in both realms. This cannot be a coincidence. The flaw must be something basic and common to both the Hittites and the Egyptians. What they have in common is a chronological system based on Egyptian dates framed by the dynastic order of Manetho, an Egyptian priest of the third century. The real problem is that the Egypt Egyptian chronological system is not synchronized with the Assyrian, Greek or B biblical system. To fix the system, the Egyptian chronology must be adjusted to agree with Greek and Assyrian chronologies. The date of Ramses II ought to be determined from the date of Hattusilus III, which is to be based on Assyrian chronology and Greek pottery dates. Then the anomalous dating of artifacts will no longer be anomalous. The gaps and dark ages will close and disappear. The Hittites will have their first millennium origins and Assyrian influences restored. The 26th dynasty will gain its tombs, mummies, inscriptions and history. Other revisionists have offered differing models for reconciling Egyptian chronology. The most widely published of these is James, Centuries of Darkness, and Roll, Pharaohs and Kings. They each have their reasons for dismissing Velikovsky, none of which stand detailed scrutiny. The results of the Hittite analysis demonstrate the inability of the James and Roll models to account for all the evidence. They both hold to the integrity of the Manethoing dynastic order, and this negates the flexibility they need to explain the Hittite results. Their models conform only to the Egyptian data and fail to take Greek or Assyrian chronology into account in several areas, including the Hittites. In other words, unless Assyrian, Egyptian, Greek and Biblical chronologies are synchronised, the revision of history fails. James has no difficulty establishing that the problem is one of stratigraphy and no difficulty assigning the cause to Egyptian chronology. The stratigraphic gaps are between 250 to 600 years. However, the bulk of these gaps are 350 to 500 years. Thus, a 250 year advancement of the chronological system still leaves large unexplained stratigraphic gaps. James's linear advancement of 250 years of late bronze strata does nothing to resolve the problems of Hittite stratigraphy, which is over 600 years in size. Roll's choice of Ramses II as the Shishak seems right at first. There is substantive evidence that Ramses II controlled Israel and even took Jerusalem. However, Ramses II also made a treaty with Hittites, Hattusilus III. Roll must place Hattusilus III in the same reigns as he places Ramses II in the 10th century with King Solomon and his son King Rehoboam. Unfortunately, the 10th century in Assyrian history was a time of greatest weakness for Assyria. They could barely defend their homeland. Thus, they could not at this time be a threat to attack or take Carchemish, as stated in the annals of Mesilus II, Hattusilus III's father. No Assyrian king took Carchemish until Sargon II in the 8th century. Thus, where Egyptian evidence may look good, the proposal fails when evidence outside Egypt is taken into account. Egyptian imperial power, Hittite imperial power, Assyrian imperial power and the capture of Jerusalem only occur in the 7th century, which is where Velikovsky replaced him, referring to Ramses the Great. Now Alan Montgomery argues the case well for the alter egos of Dynasty 26, being the pharaohs of Dynasty 19. As opposed to the dynasties ruling parallel to each other, as believed by Eric Acheson and my late friend Dale Murphy. Now combined with the coincidences of their military annals, we have Herodotus claiming that Samtek I met the Scythians at Beth Shan, yet no evidence of Dynasty 26 has ever been found there. But we do have plenty of evidence of the occupation there of the Dynasty 19 pharaohs, Sidi I and Ramses II. Now seals bearing the pronomum name of Nico II, 
Nikal Warembre have been found at Carchemish in northern Syria. A stellar of his has also been found stating his rule extended as far south as Thebes. Now he would certainly be getting in the way of Ramses the Great if he was not, not the same person and he ruled at the same time. Now the pharaohs of dynasties 19 and 26 had different pronomen names. Now this is certainly an, a weakness in the alter ego point of view. However, it should be noted that the 25th dynasty pharaohs all had double prenomens. Now Manetho has different reign lengths in order of the kings that Velikovsky claims were alter egos. Now given the inconsistencies in Manetho's records, even between the existing copies by well-known copyists, I don't see this as a big issue. Now while Manetho is an important guide, his records have their fair share of errors having been compiled centuries later. Now the 19th dynasty was based at Tanis on one of the eastern branches of the Nile Delta, while the 26th dynasty was based at Sais, which is conventionally believed to be on one of the western branches. So how do we account for this difference? Well Herodotus, when explaining the arms of the Nile Delta, amidst the Tanis branch of the Nile, and names the Sais branch where the Tanis branch should have been named. It should be noted that no ruins of the great buildings and royal sepulchres of the 26th dynasty have ever been found in the western delta at the conventional site for Sais. Now Velikovsky believed that Sais and Tanis were the same location, but there is other evidence that indicates that they were definitely separate towns. Now Alan Montgomery's candidate for Sais is Pi Ramesses. Now Pi Ramesses was a few miles outside of Tanis. Now it was separated from the capital Tanis, but not a separate capital, much like Versailles' relationship with Paris in Louis XIV's day. Now before I make some concluding comments on how the evidence affects the different revised chronologies put forth, I'd like to look at a few other pieces of evidence that argues for a separation of dynasties 18 and 19. Now a 400th anniversary event in the reign of Ramses II argues for native Egyptians ruling that length of time before Ramses II's reign. Now Donovan Corwell says the following about this event. Early in the reign of Ramses II, the king had an inscription made as a 400th anniversary of some unstated incident which must have been of significant significance to the Egyptians to warrant such recognition. Now if Dynasty 19 immediately followed Dynasty 18, then Dynasty 18 started 250 years before Ramses II, and thus this event would have occurred during the time of the hated Hyksos. However, if Ramses II ruled around 600 BC, then this event would coincide with the expulsion of the hated Hyksos just before 1000 BC, a much more likely hypothesis to me. Now Dale Murphy in his article, It's Time to Get Serious About Manetho, suggests that Manetho was not grouping the dynasties in chronological order, but grouping them in a different way. He writes, Maybe the Egyptian priest was preparing a schematic overview. Rather than being an arrangement of families as so often stated, his dynasties tend to fall into four definite political classifications and are grouped accordingly. A. Independent Egyptian autonomous families. B. Passive kings as vassals under foreign occupation. C. Alien kings and political functionaries claiming royal privilege and D, Egyptian loyalists, rebels, under foreign occupation. When viewed in the order shown here based on category, it is quite significant that we have an exact match with the conventional order of dynasties. Now, in another article by Alan Montgomery entitled A Chronological Model for the First and Second Millennium BC, he writes, Velikovsky proposed that the 22nd dynasty was preceded by the 18th. He gave many evidences that suggest a close connection of the 18th and 22nd dynasties. Osakon celebrated a royal jubilee in his 22nd year by reading a jubilee text in the Temple of Amun. Kitchen states, This very text is nothing more than a word-for-word -word copy of just such a text as occurs 
over the king carried in procession for a jubilee of Amenhotep III of the 18th dynasty depicted at Solob Temple. Osakon II supposedly overlooked the many jubilee texts of the 19th dynasty in favour of a 500-year-old text of the 18th dynasty. Why did Osakon II not use a more recent text? The chalices made in the latter part of the 18th dynasty and in the early 22nd Libyan dynasty appear to be made with the same craftsmanship and artistry. Egyptologists would have assigned the Libyan chalices to the 18th dynasty were it not for the inscriptions of Shoshank I. Why are there no similar chalices known in the 19th, 20th or 21st dynasties? Now if the 19th dynasty followed the 18th dynasty, one might expect that many aspects of the language, art, culture and religion of the 19th dynasty would show great similarities. On this point, Gardner, an eminent Egyptologist, wrote, Egypt of the 19th dynasty was considerably changed from that of the 18th dynasty. It is not impossible not to notice the marked deterioration of the art, the literature and indeed the general culture of the people. The language which they wrote approximates more closely to the vernacular and incorporates many foreign words. The copies of ancient te texts are incredibly careless." End of quote. Now both Eric and Dale in their models place the 18th dynasty and the Elamana period around 720 to 700 BC. Now this is before the late Bronze Age catastrophe. Now Greek and Assyrian chronology dates the start of the Iron One civilizations to no later than 750 BC. It is clear in the stratigraphy of Greece that the catastrophe that brought an end to the late Bronze Age is after Dynasty 18 and late Helladic 3A pottery. Eric Atchison claims that there is a consistent fold of around 630 years for both the 18th and 19th dynasties. In other words, conventional chronology is out by this number of years. Now going forward, 630 years from the conventional date for the end of the late Bronze Age catastrophe, around 1200 BC, would bring us to 570 BC, a date much too late for the catastrophe noted at the boundary of the late Bronze and the start of the Iron Age. Now Alan Montgomery makes these comments on how Eric's scheme does not work archaeologically. In Eric's model, the movement of the 19th dynasty cannot be followed by a similar movement of the 18th dynasty. There is much 8th, 7th century pottery that is dated by Greek and Biblical chronology and it always appears later than the Mycenaean pottery of the Amarna era. This makes it impossible to put the 18th dynasty strata in the 8th century. Now we can see here in this chart anywhere from one to several levels of strata between the strata contemporary with the late 18th dynasty and Mycenaean pottery from the late Bronze Age and the strata of the 7th century BC where both Eric and Dale Murphy placed the 19th dynasty. Now Dale Murphy's solution of additional lesser kings to stretch out the 18th dynasty between Amenhotep II and Thutmose IV keeps Velikovsky's synchronisms of the Biblical Shishak with Thutmose III and placing Ramses II in the 7th century. However, the Elamana period of Akhenaten is after this break and in Dale's chronology it comes just before the 19th dynasty. Again, this puts the Elamana period and its contemporary Mycenaean pottery in the 8th century BC and this stratigraphically doesn't work as Alan's evidence here shows. Now for some concluding comments on who has the best case in regards to where to place the 18th and 19th dynasties and whether there was a substantial gap or not between these dynasties. Now Eric Atchison has the 18th dynasty going from around 920 BC to 670 BC and the 19th dynasty straight after that. Now he has Shishak as the last Hyksos king which would make him an Amalekite. Now there is no record of any campaign to, into Israel by this king. And given the Amalekites were Israel's arch enemies it is unlikely Solomon would have made a treaty with them or married Agag the second's daughter. Now Eric has the Amarna period of the late 18th dynasty around 720 to 700 BC. 
late Hellenic 3A pottery of the Amarna period is always found chronologically before the destruction levels of the late Bronze Age catastrophe, which can be dated to no later than 750 BC. We have also seen that there is substantial strata between those connected to the 18th and 19th dynasties, not continuity where the strata associated with dynasty 18 is followed by strata associated with dynasty 19. Also, in Eric's chronology, the Amarna period of Akhenaten and Tutankhamun overlaps with the Ethiopian 25th dynasty, which is a mismatch as straight after Samaria's fall, the Assyrian records have Egypt under their tribute, supposedly during the reigns of Akhenaten and Tutankhamun, who the El Amarna letters clearly say at the same time had hegemony over Israel and Syria. Now, my late friend Dale Murphy accepts Velikovsky's view of Topmost III as the biblical Shishak. Now, he has six extra lesser kings between Amenhotep II, the time Zero is defeated by God and Asa, and Topmost IV, with the Libyans' prime rulers in the period of those lesser kings. Now, Akhenaten rules after Topmost IV, so his Elamana period of late 18th dynasty is around 720 to 710 BC. Now, late Hellenic 3A pottery of the Elamana period is always found chronologically before the destruction levels of the late Bronze Age catastrophe, which can be dated to no later than 750 BC. Now, we've also seen that there is substantial strata between those connected to the 18th and 19th dynasties, not continuity, where the strata associated with dynasty 19 is followed by strata associated with dynasty 19. Now, like in Eric's chronology, he has the Amarna period of Akhenaten and Tutankhamun overlapping with the Ethiopian 25th dynasty, which again is a mismatch since the Syrian records have Egypt under their tribute, though the Elamana letters say that at the same time that Egypt had hegemony over Israel and Syria. Now, Donovan Corville, while accepting Velikovsky's placement of the 18th dynasty, accepts the conventional view that dynasty 19 followed straight after Dynasty 18. Now he has Ramses the Great reigning for 67 years starting from just after 800 BC. Now he identifies him as the Pharaoh So of Hoshea's time just before Samaria's fall. And he has Ramses III of the 20, 20th Dynasty ruling in parallel with Ramses II's successor Meremptah. And he has 20, dynasties 21 to 24, running parallel with dynasties 19, 20, and 25. Now, Ramses the Great's father in this chronology, Seti, would be ruling in the weaker period of Israel and Judah, following the reign of Jehoshaphat. But Ramses the Great would be ruling in the period of Israelite expansion under Isaiah and Jeroboam II. Though it is possible they still could have been under Egyptian hegemony. Now, that said, it doesn't match the great amount of archaeological evidence presented by both Emmanuel Velikovsky and Alan Montgomery, especially evidence from the Hittite Empire that supports Ramses the Great ruling in the 7th century BC and that dynasties 18 and 19 were separated by 150 years. Now, David Down supports the same basic chronology as Donovan Corville, with some minor adjustments. And he believes Dynasty 20 ruled much later when Velikovsky claimed that it ruled. In relation to the placements of Dynasties 18 and 19, he follows Donovan Corville. Now, Emmett Sweeney is another revisionist of Egypt's chronology. Now, he accepts Velikovsky's identifications of Shishak with Tutmos III and Ramses the Great with Nico but his radically reduced chronology has dynasties 19 immediately follow, following dynasty 18 because he rejects the Bible's chronology. Now, taking his lead from the drastically reduced chronology and radical interpretation of stratigraphy by Gunnar Henschen, his dates for dynasty 18 are reduced by 250 years by making kings of the Persian Empire the same as the kings of the later Syrian and Babylonian empires. Now, in addition to how much biblical and Mesopotamian recorded history this contradicts, there are also many demonstrable differences in the lives of those kings that he claims are one and the same. 
Now, while he places the 19th dynasty in the right place and time, we have the evidence shown by Alan Montgomery of multiple strata between the stratas contemporary with the late 18th and those contemporary with the 19th dynasty. The revised chronologies of David Rowland and Peter James have the highest profile apart from Velikovsky's. In a paper published in the SIS journal, they work together on an excellent compression of the third intermediate period, which has dynasties 21 to 25, going from around 820 BC to 660 BC. Now, Velikovsky places the third intermediate period between exactly these same dates. So in that respect, Velikovsky, Peter, D David Roll, and Peter James are in agreement. So that is fantastic to at least have that agreement. Now, I personally think that is very cool that they're all on the same page with, the, with at least that. Now, the point of difference between David Roll and Peter James is the length that they assign to the, to the 20th dynasty. Now, David Roll compresses it 100 years longer than Peter James, hence why their placements for dynasties 18 and 19 differ by 100 years. Now, Velikovsky places dynasties 20 and 21 at a much later period, which we'll examine in a later lecture. Now, both David and Peter maintain the conventional order of dynasties for the New Kingdom. They and John Bimson have presented a number of points and arguments against changing the conventional order of dynasties for the New Kingdom period. Now, I've gone through the key arguments in the, of theirs in the last lecture and personally believe that the counter-arguments are reasonable without clutching at straws. Now, additionally, each of them has mismatches for where they place the Biblical Shishak and Dynasty 18 and the time of the Elamana letters. Now both of them place most or all of Dynasty 18 during the time of the Judges. Now we know from Egyptian records such as Tutmose III's record of Palestinian cities at Karnak and Tutmose IV's Berlin pedestal that its pharaohs made many expeditions into Palestine and there's a couple of others by Amenhotep II in addition to those two. Now, if the 18th dynasty ruled during the time of the Judges, why is there no record of them in the Book of Judges, especially given Tutmose IV's explicit mention of him subduing the nation of Israel? Now, neither of their Shishak candidates, Ramses II and Ramses III, boast about the capture of 3,000 tons of gold from Jerusalem that were in Solomon's temple. Only Tutmose III boasts about having such a treasure. Now, having gone through the evidence that Alan Montgomery presents in his articles The Hittite Problem and Greek Pottery, Dark Ages and Egyptian Chronology, I believe that there is a voluminous amount of archaeological proof, both in Egypt but mostly outside of Egypt, that supports Velikovsky's view that the 18th dynasty and 19th dynasty were separated by 150 years and the Libyan and Ethiopian dynasties. To support the New Kingdom chronologies of either either of those British scholars, one has to reject all that voluminous amount of archaeological proof that we've gone through. Now, neither of their 250 or 350 year reductions of Egyptian chronology are sufficient to correct the Dark Age gaps in Greece, Turkey and Syria that are almost twice as long. Their dates for the end of the, of the 19th dynasty and the end of the late Bronze Age of 950 BC for Peter James and 850 BC for David Roll still leave a 200 year and 100 year dark age gap respectively in Greece even before we look at the larger dating gaps in Turkey created by the conventional dates for Ramses the Great. Now neither of their chronologies also account for the difference in the length of dating gaps between Greece and Turkey, which matches the length of the third intermediate period, as believed by both of them and by Velikovsky. The clear implications from the consistent archaeological dating gaps in Greece, on average around 480 years, and Turkey, on average around 630 years, I feel are much more objective, numerous, and better to rely on than the very questionable genealogies written centuries after to establish whether or not there was a 150 year gap between dynasties 18 and 19. Now Peter James has the Elamana period during the time of the judges when the Bible is absolutely silent about Egypt though it speaks of many other nations harassing Israel during this period. 
He has Ramses III as the biblical Shishak some 200 years before the earliest known examples of the Greek alphabet have, have been found around 750 BC. Yet tiles in Ramses III's palace with his name on have Greek letters on the back of them. Now this is also an issue for David Roll who places Ramses III's reign no later than 820 BC. Now David Roll has Ramses II of the 19th dynasty as the biblical Shishak, which places his father at the same time as Solomon. Yet Seti the Great occupies Beth Shan in Israel while supposedly Solomon's empire is at its height. Now additionally, supporting their new kingdom chronologies means rejecting what I consider the mother of all synchronisms. Velikovsky's amazing match of the Jerusalem temple objects with the phenomenal amount of gold, silver and bronze offered to Amun by Thutmose III on a wall in the temple of Karnak. So, was there a gap between dynasties 18 and 19? Well, my personal conclusion is that there is overwhelming evidence in support of Velikovsky's view that there was indeed a 150-year gap between dynasties 18 and 19, and that the Libyan and Ethiopian dynasties did indeed rule in between them. 